I don't want to sound unenthusiastic about drafting Keegan Murray. And you because, shouldn't have brought me on because I'm not going to be enthusiastic. Okay, good. Because I'm not really super enthusiastic about it, and I'm kind of right. closeted about it. What? What? Why do you feel the same thing as that? Because to me, you know what it is, man? It's one of those guys where you recognize, like, if you're getting them, it's a good pick. But, like, it feels like we can get more value at the fifth pick. Like, it, like with Shaden Sharp, at least there's a boom, like, element there. You know? Like, this just feels to me like we're getting, like, like another Tobias Harris-type player. And it's like, like, do you want to pay that guy upwards of $30 million a year at some point? I don't know. What is going on? I want to welcome you from Half Court for today, Wednesday, June 22nd. I am your host, Sean Murphy, alongside my guy, Jeff Ifrady. Jeff, what it do, baby? How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm excited. It's a big week. It and is. we got our guy, Bryce, the man himself, the guy that I rely on to go and watch some film on. Oh, because hold on, hold on, Jeff. Hold on. We'll get there. We'll get there. I was saving, I was saving something a little special for Bryce. I was trying to keep it a surprise. Normally, we got all right. We got our guy below me, Troy Sergi. Troy, how's it going, my guy? Doing good, Sean. I thought last week was the most exciting week I could think of for June for basketball, with it being the nearing close of the NBA Finals and then and then ending. But to be honest, I'm more pumped about this week with the draft. I really am. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's a great week. I mean, last week we crowned an NBA champion, and now we draft the next generation and future of NBA stars. And what better way to talk about it than a star of Pistons basketball content? And now, introducing in the top right corner from Kansas, Bryce, aka Motor City. Oops. Bryce, what's going on, man? Thanks what's up, Sean? Here. Man, that that is sweet, man. I, every time <laughs> I record with you, you got something going on that I love. <laughs> And so I, I can't be any more Kansas than I am right now. I was telling you guys, I'm straight out of the harvest field, um, walked into my sister's library. That's why I don't have any piss and stuff. I, I feel left out here. I don't got my piss and stuff in the background. Um, but I'm excited to talk NBA draft, prospects at number five, and, and whatever else you guys want to get into. Oh, absolutely, man. And hey, don't don't feel alone. I mean, we got Troy. He's moving into he just moved into his new house. So he's congrats, kinda, Troy. He's, congrats. He's, yes, yeah, he's in this situation where he's trying to figure out. You know, he's he's in the Hoosier state now, too. He's this guy might start going to Pacers games and everything. So we uh we might have to have a conversation about that at some point. But we're going to have be, we're going to be having a lot of conversations because this is from half court reaching every week. We talk all things NBA basketball through the lens of being diehard business fans. If you like that, be sure to like this video, subscribe to the podcast and share with your friends and join the conversation in the in the comments down below also we are happy to say that this podcast is brought to you by the lovely people at manscape but we'll tell you about that later first it's time because it's the nba draft week gentlemen and bryce jeff and i literally hopped into a call and both had the same idea before even approaching each other and it was that we needed to have you on the podcast and literally i was saving it in my head i was like there's no better time to bring Bryce on than NBA draft time because this is, first of all, if people don't know what you do, you are, first of all, obviously you got the Pistons Pulse podcast uh, that you're a part of uh, with uh, with Omari from uh, Detroit Free Press. Um, you guys are killing that. Um, but on top of that, you also do a lot of breakdowns, a lot of film stuff and talk about a lot of prospects. Do you want to tell people a little bit more about like your content and what people can find and expect from you. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, the Pistons Pulse podcast, obviously that's the main thing like Detroit Pistons stuff. I, I ride over at Detroit bad boys as well, but mm -hmm. I just started doing the NBA draft stuff, you know, like the Pistons had the number one pick last year. I didn't get into it too much. And then this season I was like, I'm just going to dive head first. So I started making breakdown videos. That's kind of, I'm more of a video guy than a, a article, you know, writing stuff out. Mm -hmm. And at Mavs Draft, if you guys know him, he does Locked On Big Board. Yep. Um, Richard Stamen is his name. He has a website. He's like, hey, can I just start putting these on your website? So they're on my YouTube channel or his website. 
I just enjoy watching basketball and breaking it down, guys. And, and maybe some people want to watch it and, and check these guys out. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, and then the thing that I love about the way that you do it is you do it with such a positive energy about you. Like you're always in a good mood, always excited to talk about the game and every prospect, you always find things that excite you and things that things that you think can really prosper. And so that's one of the things I love about you is that, is that you, it's all about the love of the game and, you know, and that's, that's what like this channel is about. And that's what we want to highlight is, is people that love the game and just want to talk about the game. And so that's why we're just glad to have you, man. But with that, let's get right into it. I mean, this, this is a really interesting draft class. I mean, I would argue if there's any year to have five, to have the fifth overall pick, this is probably both the best and the worst year at the same time to have the number five overall pick because there's a lot of decisions that can be made for you. But on the other hand, there might be certain prospects that you like that you don't have in the entire control of whether or not they go there. Now, uh, Bryce, I'm just going to come out and say I'm a Jaden Ivey guy. I'm just going to be honest with you with this fifth overall pick. In my opinion, if you can't go get one of those three marquee bigs in this draft, go get the best guard in this draft. Go get the guy that can you can pair with Cade and a guy that can put the ball in the basket. What do you think about the potential fit of Cade and, and, and Jaden Ivey? Because I know there's certain people, I'm not going to name names, uh, <laughs> easy, uh, that have been talking about uh, if this guy fits with Cade and if this is actually something that can lead to championships. I want to know what your thoughts are. I want to say this because I've been thinking about it all day because I knew this was going to come up. If Jaden Ivey wants to fit next to Cade Cunningham, Jaden Ivey can fit next to Cade Cunningham. And, and I know that's true for anybody, but if Jaden Ivey is okay playing a little bit more off ball, if Jaden Ivey is okay not being the primary ball handler, he has a skill set that can work next to Cade Cunningham. Is it the perfect fit? No, I'll give you the perfect fit. We can talk about it later because I love talking about my guy, Benedict Matherin. But <laughs> Jaden Ivey, I think, is the better player. I have him ranked higher. I've said it for weeks now. Jaden Ivey would be my number one, Benedict Matherin number two, in terms of realistic possibilities. Obviously, the top three are different. But I think he can play next to Cade Cunningham. The shooting on catch and shoot is good enough. And Jaden Ivey, what does he do best? He gets to the rim. Let Cade break down the defense, kick it to him. Now Jaden Ivey's attacking a hard closeout, and then he's getting into the paint and causing havoc there. Now, does he have to get better? Sure, but I think he can do those things. Yeah, without a doubt. And, and Jeff, just talking about a guy who has just such a high ceiling, I mean, Troy Weaver even talked about it today, guys, just about how – you want to go get the guy who can fit this team long term, but also hopefully can play a little bit right now. To me, that sounds less like a guy like, no offense, like Shaden Sharp. And that sounds more in the line of a guy like a Keegan Murray or a Benedict Matherin or a Jaden Ivey. Some of these guys who have that balance of ceiling, but also can come in and contribute right away. Yeah, and I would agree with you. I think everything Bryce just said and more. I think another benefit of having a guy like Jaden Ivey, and I talked about this, is last year when Cade came off the floor, your offensive efficiency, that was a problem. And now with Jaden Ivey, the fit on the court, I don't really have a question about because you hit on it. If he wants to fit, he'll fit. But especially when Cade goes off the floor, he's on the bench. You have a guy in the game that can make plays for others, kind of like with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. If, if Jason or Jalen gets into foul trouble or injury, rest, whatever it is, you know you have another guy that can create shots and, and get to the rim at will. So I love it. Um, I, I, I'm a guy you draft on upside. That's what the NBA is. You look at measurables, and then you hope the guys pan out to what you expect them to be. And I think Jaden Ivey, he's just too dynamic. He's worked out for two teams, the Magic and the Pistons. Like, if he's not going number one, he wants to come to Detroit. So, And I think I think the Pistons organization and Charlie Weaver appreciate that. Like, if you want mm -hmm. to play in Detroit, they're looking. Right. And Absolutely. I think with that, with that too, Sean, you know, Cade Cunningham doesn't have to always be a ball dominant guard, nor is that, I think his for, uh, his forte either. Um, you know, I think Ivy can come in and control the ball too. I mean, preferably we want the ball in Cade's hands mostly, but, um, at the same time, Cade can facilitate. Yeah. Cade can dish. Um, well, well, when you look at Dallas, you look at how yeah. over-reliant they are where, at times with Luka Doncic. I mean, exactly. even though they have Jalen Brunson there, I mean, they're, that offense at times is too reliant Correct. on Luka Correct. Doncic. And you have a situation where in that Western Conference Finals, they kind of fell apart because mm -hmm. who else do you go to? 
where's yeah. that offense running other than other than Luca? So that's that's the balance. Do you exactly. want to because if because the more you have the ball in Cade's hands, the more opportunity there is for great things to happen. But on the other hand, we've seen that with Cade, there's nights where he's the way that he's going to affect winning isn't always going to be offense. Sometimes right. it has to be through other ways because his shot's not always going to go through. So the thing with this team, we don't have enough guys that can put the ball in the basket. And we just need guys that can score the basketball. And Jaden Ivey, when you're talking about just a guy who can create a shot for himself, I would argue he's the best available player at that skill. I mean, you know, maybe Shaden Sharp as far as going forward. I mean, you could make the argument Keegan Murray is a guy who can hit a jump shot pretty well, but he can't really create a shot for himself for the most part, especially, you know, he might not be able to in the NBA level just yet. But I think Jaden Ivey has that balance of floor and ceiling, in my opinion. Yeah, I would agree. And I think the the fit question more, and you guys started to allude to it there, you're going to want Jaden Ivey to be the primary ball handler at times. So what does that do with Killian Hayes, right? Like that's more of the dynamic mm -hmm. I'm interested in. If it's Benedict Matherin or Keegan Murray, those guys aren't, you know, playing into who has the ball in their hands as much as Jay Nivey. Like, I think you'd want to stagger minutes with him and Cade, put the ball in Jay Nivey's hands. Well, now how many minutes are left over for Killian Hayes to have the ball in his hands? And then also with Cade, let Jay Nivey facilitate. Let Cade have more energy for defense, for rebounding, for all of the intangible things that he's so great at because he doesn't have to just be this Luka Doncic heliocentric player. What makes him special and is going to make him special is he can impact the game in so many ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and just to add to that too, I think with Cade's game, like he just wants to win. Like yes. Keith brought this up too. Like he may not be your leading scorer, but if you win, he's okay. And I think that's what's going to open up opportunities for Killian, uh, even Jay Nivey. Now Killian's going to have to, you know, learn to play off ball as well and, and be a better catch and shoot guy, especially with Jay Nivey. But certainly that backcourt man would be exciting. Like the defensive upside of those two in the backcourt, like my God, they're going to give you issues and they're going to, they're going to kick your ass offensively. So yeah. it's going to be exciting to watch. Well, speaking of defense, let's talk about that with Jaden Ivey a little bit because if you look at his de defensive ratings and statistics, I mean, let let's not beat around the bush, guys. It's hot dog water. I mean, like let's just. But he's got the he's got the measurables. He can do no, it. No, he's got the measurables. That's what I'm saying. Like I I would I would agree that he has upside, a lot of upside, as far as as far as his defensive ability. But from watching from watching tape or from doing breakdowns, Bryce, I'm like. From watching what you've seen from Jay Ivey on the defensive end, do you think it really is like, do you think it's just a mental thing? Like when he's locked in, he can be effective. Do you think it's a skill thing where he's, where like he's just lacking and needs to grow? Do you think it's a mixture of things? What do you, what do you think it is? Yeah, it's, it's inconsistency. I think it's the focus thing because there are reps where you're like, man, this dude can guard. Like he can get after it. He can stay in front of the ball. I think in my notes, I even put like, maybe he's a guy, I know this will sound weird for a guy that's labeled a bad defender. Maybe you just put him on the other team's best player and say, this is your only assignment tonight. Like you yeah. just need to lock this dude down. Stop worrying about rotation. Stop worrying about tagging the role guy. Stop worrying about this. Go guard this guy. And if you can hold him to 20 instead of his normal 26, then we'll count that as a win for the night. So I do think he has the potential to do some of those things. It's just the focus was like, there's some really bad reps. There truly are guys. Yeah. But there is also, there is also those final couple minutes against North Carolina as well, though. You know what I mean? Like there are stretches where, you know, there are stretches where it's bad, but like, like I said, you know, I think you really have to look in college because it, it's hard to say with these young guys, it's like, okay, well you might not be defending at this level, but like when your paycheck's literally on the line, it's probably a whole different discussion. Right. So um, I, I, I wonder if Ivy, you know, and, and I, and again, that's where you talk about environment. It's why I, if Ivy comes into the Pistons, I'm less worried about that than say, if he goes to the Kings, because if he does go to Sacramento for one, I just don't like the fit for him at all there. I think it's a competition right away between him and deer and Fox. And I think it just makes the vibes terrible because they already traded one point guard away. <laughs> well, yeah, you literally drafted Davion Mitchell last year too. I mean, you're just, yeah. Um, that, but you know, again, there, it, it just, to me, like there's, there's pros and cons of every prospect. And I think, I think Ivy has the ones that in my opinion can be worked around the easiest. And going off of one thing about the defense, just one point too, is 
I, I'm not worried about those intangibles at all with, with a guy like Ivy in this system. Because we think of a guy like Dwayne Casey. We think of a guy like Troy Weaver. I mean, they're going to demand – Detroit. Detroit, known for their defense. I mean, I just I just feel like those are areas that are so easy to improve if you're in the right culture and you're in the right atmosphere. And Detroit certainly has that uh, for any young player, but especially a guy like Jaden Ivey. Yeah, well, I, I just want to say real quick, Sean, like I have no firsthand knowledge of this. This is just trying to judge body language. I got a little bit of intel, I guess, but – I don't know that he was super happy at Purdue. Like he's playing in an offensive system with two bigs where the emphasis was throw it inside, high, low, all this stuff. And I saw a lot of stuff between him and his teammates, like after possessions, walking to time. I'm not saying it was toxic. I'm not saying it was bad. I'm not saying Purdue. I'm not trying to dog on Purdue. Right. Like, but happiness does play a part in how guys perform on the court, whether we want to admit that or not. It's the same in all of our jobs. When you're around people you enjoy, you perform better, in my experience anyway. Yeah, yep. So I do think there was a little bit of that. I'm not saying a lot, but I do think there was a little. And can I can I ask you too, Bryce? Like, and I I tend to think this with Jaden Ivey. I think he's he's going to benefit with the NBA spacing and the flip. Like, what is your opinion on that for a guy who's so good in transition, uh, so dynamic, so athletic? What do you think that's going to do for him at the next level? Having you know all that space, running pick and rolls. Yeah, a hundred percent. I would get so frustrated watching Purdue because. It was literally like throw the ball into the big and throw the ball to the high post to <laughs> throw the and I, I realize that's basketball. I, yeah. I I understand it. I get it. It was effective. They win a lot of games. It was just like Jaden Ivey's over there on the wing, give him the ball, send him a ball screen, or just clear it out. Throw you know. So I, I wonder if that's where some of the frustrations came from. And I do want to say this real quick. He played a lot off the ball, guys. He didn't play a lot as like the true point. People don't talk about either. that. So yep. he he can do it, has done it. Now, maybe he wasn't happy doing it. That's what I would like to know more of. And I'm sure those questions were asked of him whenever Troy Weaver had the chance. Well, and again, here's another thing that we saw pop up on the timeline today that not a lot of people like to talk about or, or we didn't talk about before. Look at this kid. Jay Nivey right there. <laughs> Pistons gear and everything. Yeah. His mom played for the Detroit Shock, current coach of University of Notre Dame women's basketball. Like, this kid grew up, he knows Detroit basketball. He's seen what that looks like, even to a certain extent from his mom with the Detroit Shock, even though it's obviously not the direct same thing. There's that culture there. He knows what that looks like. So it seems to me, like from the reports that he doesn't really want to go to Sacramento, it seems to me like, Detroit's his preferred destination as well. But let's talk about the other guy in the Vegas odds on favorite to go at the fifth overall pick. And that's Keegan Murray. Now, I don't want to sound unenthusiastic about drafting Keegan Murray. So you because, should have brought me on because I'm not going to be enthusiastic. Okay, good. Because I'm not really super enthusiastic about it. And I'm kind of closeted about it. What, what, why do you feel the same thing as that? Because to me, you know what it is, man? It's one of those guys where you recognize, like, if you're getting them, it's a good pick. But, like, it feels like we can get more value at the fifth pick. Like, it, like with Shaden Sharp, at least there's a boom, like, element there. You know? Like, this just feels to me like we're getting, like, like another Tobias Harris type player. And it's like, like, do you want to pay that guy upwards of $30 million a year at some point? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think the fan side of me is right there with you, Sean. It's like, man, I want somebody to be – Jaden Ivey's exciting, and I think he's a good player. Benedict Matherin, again, is my guy, and I think there, he's a really, really good player. Shaden Sharp, there's like this mystery box and a 50-inch vertical and all this stuff. And then Keegan Murray, like, he just gets buckets and he goes about his business, and he's a really good basketball player, and it's like, eh, like, so be it. But – he is a really good basketball player, guys, and I think he would fit well. He would bring some nice things to the team. He defends well. He can shoot it. I do think there's a – he's not going to self-create, but there may be a little bit more there than like what I even give him credit for. And the ceiling's probably a little bit higher. He's going to come in. He's going to be a great player, number three, number four option. If you don't pay him the contract you're talking – that's why Tobias Harris, he's overpaid for the right. bullies in like that's the issue with him well and the well the other thing too is like you know it's not like that kind of guy can't be worth that type of money at a certain point but it's like what are you producing in order to get up there because when tobias harris when he was in the right situation when he was at his peak he was a kind he was really good especially that clipper year where he was at his all-star caliber play but i think the thing is is like you know you truly 
like art, like you don't know what you're going to get out of those type of guys at all times, because at, you, you know, you're getting a floor of at least some form of solid play, but you're not, you, you don't know if you're going to get that ceiling either that can come in and really affect winning in the ways that we hope he could, because, you know, he was productive in college, but he's not going to get some of his buckets as easily as he did in college. That's I just agree. the truth. Yeah. Yeah, I guess just to counter that, I mean, I'm I'm pretty much on board with this. I I, I would say Ivy is the better player and who I would want at five for sure. But I guess my counterpoint is that every team, all 30 teams, would benefit from a Tobias Harris. So oh, therefore, sure. we get better. We do get better with a but Keegan Murray. We do get better, but can we get better? Could, but could we get even better getting somebody else? That's my question. And I would agree with you as Ivy is the better. No, you're 100% right, Troy. There's nothing wrong with Keegan Murray at number five. Like, I, I'm not a, I'm not walking away Thursday night upset. I just have two players that I'm more excited about and guys who I do think will be better and have a higher ceiling. I, I would I would want Keegan Murray over Shane Sharp, to be honest with you guys. As, as much fun and as much content. Right. Like, we're all content creators. Shane yep. Sharp is the ideal pick for us. And right. Keegan Murray is not the ideal pick for us. But I'm still. I would still rather have Keegan Murray than Shane Sharp or anybody else other than Ivy Matherin and the top three. Right. And again, I want whoever's going to help the Detroit Pistons win basketball games. Absolutely. Like that's that's the number one priority. So whoever that player is, that's got to be who it is. And 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 there are a lot of there is a lot of upside objectively that Keegan Murray brings. It's just first of all, you don't know when Detroit's going to be this high in the lottery again because because if we're talking about this team going in next year, saying we want to win more basketball games. The conversation shouldn't be, well, should we be in the lottery next year? Cause we're not going to be like, that's the goal. We're not right. So we're, we might not have the chance to get a guy that has the caliber of play of a guy like say Jay Nivey, or even, even guys like Benedict Matherin to a certain extent, those guys aren't available every year. And can we talk about Benedict Matherin? I want to see Bryce's take for a while. Oh, Oh, yeah. absolutely. We're getting there because Bryce, you are there. There are some, there are some people in the Pistons community that love Benedict Mather. And I, I was talking to my guy, James Edwards, the third earlier, I know him and Nick on the, on, uh, on the button card. I know those guys are, are motor are uh, Ben Matherin guys, but Bryce, you are a Ben Matherin guy. First this of all, I know, and, and it's not a bad thing. I, I love didn't, I didn't even mean to. It just kind of happened. Like I just like walked <laughs> into it, and like everybody's like, "Hey, you like Benedict Mather?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah. He's super athletic. He can shoot it. He can shoot it off movement. I think he's a dog on ball defensively. He can get after. He's a game changer there. The ceiling's high. The floor is high. He's a great fit next to Cade. And all of a sudden, I'm the Benedict, Benedict Mather guy. And so I will wear it. Um, my first cycle, NBA draft cycle of breaking these prospects down. I hope Benedict Matherin doesn't flame out in, in a year or two, and I'm dead wrong. I, I just think he can do a lot. I, I think his floor is high in the Keegan Murray mold. I think he's the absolute perfect fit next to Cade Cunningham, and I do think there's a ceiling there if the ball handling, self-creation, pick-and-roll offense comes around. Mm -hmm. Now, Bryce, I know a player comp that I've heard quite a bit. Don't say Benedict KCP or I'm leaving. Okay, good. I was about to go there and then you and then you stopped me. I'm just kidding. No, no, that's totally okay. That's totally okay. What would what would be an appropriate comp what would be an appropriate comp you would make and why why would you, why would you slow down on Pistons fans making that comp? Cuz I think I think you take that cuz the way I I interpreted that. I know part I know party is joking cuz you're Bryce and you're a super nice guy. But also it seems to me like you think that's a little bit of an insult. It seems like you think this guy could be a little bit better than KCP. I do. I, I think that is his floor. And so yeah. that's why I like it is like, hey, if he ends up being KCP, that's not maybe great value at five, but you, it's still a quality player, right? That's a player yep. you could use and, 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 and win with. I just think there's more to his game. I just think he, he has the ability to do more offensively. And I think his movement shooting, he elevates so high. I, I watched film of him operating in ball screens and making passes and it got better throughout the season. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I just, I'm buying the defense off ball is a little questionable, but on ball, I saw him wreck complete possessions single-handedly. You talk about the Detroit mentality. This kid's going to play with that. You know what? You know, what's something I think about with Benedict Mathern literally with that. I don't with any other prospect 
I just see playoff basketball when I watch this guy play. Sure. Like he just looks like a guy that's born for that environment. I mean, sure. Troy, Jeff, I'd love to know your thoughts. I mean, like his his length, his versatility, his scoring, his his aggressiveness on both ends, his defensive ability. I mean, this is a guy when if we're talking about playoff basketball, this might be a guy I'd want on my team. Yeah, and I think uh, a big question that we like to ask as fans, uh, kind of more of a funny question, but are they a hooper or a basketball player? And I honestly <laughs> think Benedict Matherin has both, guys. Like, he yeah. has the ability to get buckets, to to impact the game, but also he's just a smart player, too. Mm -hmm. um, he cares about winning. You can definitely see that, as Sean says, that he's kind of meant to play in those big moments. Uh, but the big thing that I like about him is just his ability to score and, um, again, impact the game. And how many times have we talked about players like an Andre Drummond? I mean, I know different positions, but they can be stat guys, but they have little to no impact on the game. But Benedict Matherin absolutely impacts any and every game that he played on uh, this past year. So, yeah, I'm, I'm high on him too, but I just don't know if he's the best pick at five. Well, I, well my thing with Benedict Matherin has always been – if there's a situation, and and Jeff and I actually we just filmed a, well, there's already a video on this channel as of when this comes out about us talking about Jeremy Grant. If we're talking about like who we could draft at seven, if we get yeah. that pick from Portland, definitely that seems like the prime opportunity to get a guy like Keegan Murray at five, and then a guy like Benedict Matherin at seven. Now, now there's a legitimate case Indiana could possibly go and get Benedict Matherin at six because he would fit pretty well. With, with Tyrese Halliburton as well. I think he fits better with Cade. That's my opinion. But, I mean, Rice, what do you think about that type of scenario? I mean, a situation. I mean, obviously, I know I know you wouldn't want to risk losing Benedict Matherin. But, I mean, you know, I, 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 think, I think he's a guy that very much could be in play at seven as well. Yeah, I mean, getting Jaden Ivey obviously would make this a, a – more of a home run, but if you walked away with Murray and Matherin, I'd be super excited on Thursday night. Cause again, Keegan Murray is going to be a quality NBA player. Yep. And then as I've talked about Benedict Matherin, I don't have to rave about it. If you want to know what Troy's talking about, go watch the TCU NCAA tournament game. That, that dude made play after play after play. And it wasn't just making huge shots. He got an offensive rebound. That was the most impressive play of the night in that game. Jabari Smith Jr. is the only guy I've scouted whose defensive intensity and pride was maybe higher than what I saw at times from Benedict Matherin. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, another guy at the top of that draft class who played with defensive intensity was Chet Holmgren. We'll talk about him in a minute. We'll get we'll we'll get to the top. Uh, we'll get to the top of the board in a little bit because I want to well, say. I want to, I want to hear Jeff on Benedict Matherin. Can we get Jeff on Benedict? Oh, absolutely. Matherin? I wanted to stay here for a minute because I wanted to get get these guys' thoughts, Jeff. Where are you at on Benny? I like him. And I, and I want to add this too. If you're going to take him at seven, you're taking him at five. Like he's, if he's good enough to go to seven, you'll, you'll be okay with that. I think five, I mean, you're two spots and you think his upside's that high. And that's a guy who wants to win too. Like Troy hit on it. I want guys that want to win. I, he's not a guy he's fearless. And you saw it too. He plays with so much passion. I like those players. That's why I like Jay Nivey, um, especially in a backcourt with Kate. I, I would agree with you too, Bryce talking about he's the best fit. I mean, that's, that's, that's true. Like you have a guy you can play off ball for sure. And he has that playmaking upside. Like that's the guy you look for. It, it, you know, if, if Jay Nivey for whatever reason is gone and, and you cannot take him, I'd rather have Bendig Mather than Keegan Murray. Me that's too. my that's my that's my point of view on it. Tro Troy, where are you sorry, I, I don't mean to ask quite Troy, where are you at? Because would you go if I you what's your order? Ivy Murray math? Yeah, I Ivy okay. Murray math. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would go I, I would go personally Ivy Math Murray. But I I I I because listen, I, I know there's a lot of value that Murray brings. And and listen, for it feels hypocritical for someone that talks so much about positionless basketball and versatility and, and, and defensive switching and all this stuff. It feels really hypocritical to say, I want Jay Nivey after talking about all those things when Keegan Murray literally fits all those things and bring a ton of value to the team. It's just, again, I just feel like there's just, again, it's just, I just feel like there's better players. I just really do. Hey, you know, he's... I, as, especially as, as, as you know what, you know, I think part of it is too, and maybe subconsciously it's the fact that as Pistons fans for so long, we've seen us draft the safe player or the guy who, who could come in and play serviceably. But then we see other guys who we could have drafted that turned out to be stars. Maybe it's just that like fear yeah. of missing out thing. 
but also I but also I think I am still coming at it from a basketball analytical standpoint of right. just the skill sets and things that we can get in this draft. I think again, I think there's guys like I think we're seeing more and more guys like Keegan Murray coming out each and every year. Right, right. And I think with Ivy going back to him, I mean one thing that I think we don't talk about enough is that he truly is the best point guard in this draft. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, that's important to note because we think, oh, five, like you mentioned earlier, Sean, it's kind of a blessing and a curse to be at five. Um, but I think with Ivy, he's the best position uh, in, well, best player in his position in this draft. And you guys mentioned on the Woodward show, you and Jeff uh, earlier the, last night, um, there is the potential, not saying it will happen, but there's the potential that he could be the best player in the draft period. And I, I just feel like, mm-hmm. you know, I think all four of us, Ivy has to be number one on our list. So agree. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Now, Troy Weaver, like we said, he talked about how he, he doesn't necessarily see it as having one specific guy. He likes, he sees it as like multiple different scenarios breaking through. I think Troy Weaver knows who he wants. And like, like, you know, it's like, it's one of those things where I think he's a pretty transparent guy for the most part, but I think he holds a lot of cards to his chest. And before we, before we uh, go into the, uh, before we go into the quick ad break, I do want to ask you guys, who do you think Troy Weaver is ultimately selecting? Who do you think the Detroit Pistons are walking away with at the fifth overall pick? Bryce, I want to start with you. I think Jay Nivey goes number four. Um, whether to the Kings or a trade up. And I actually do think Troy Weaver is going to select Keegan Murray. All right, Jeff, what about you? That's, that sounds about right, Bryce. I'm, I'm not <laughs> that, if that, that, that. There's going to be a team that forks up assets to go get a guy like Jay, Jay Nivey. Now, if the Pistons stay put at five and he's there, you take him. Uh, I think he checks all the boxes uh, for a guy who's coming to Detroit. But if he's not there, give me Benedict Matherin. <laughs> What about our report, guys, from this afternoon? I mean, Keegan Murray had literally dinner with uh, Sabonis and De'Aaron Fox the other night. Uh, I think he's going for. uh, Keegan Murray's going for, and I think our boy's coming to to Motown. Listen, I want to believe it, man. I really do. I don't believe anything this time of year. Well, yeah, well, that's well, tough. that's the other thing. First of all, I don't believe anything this time of year. I know, I know everything I've read from everything I've read from Sacramento because I've been doing a lot of reading from Sacramento over the past few days, and all I've heard is how high Mike Brown is on Keegan Murray, how high their coaching staff is on Keegan Murray, how high like they they had they brought him out and had dinner with Sabonis and De'Aaron Fox, like those like and and meanwhile, Jaden Ivey literally hasn't talked to the Kings. They're bringing out Keegan Murray and whining and dining this guy and Jay Nivey, who's probably going to be their pick. They haven't said a damn word to, but only the Kings would bring a guy out, dine him, prospect him, have him meet their star (laughs) players, and then go with the guy that they haven't said a damn word to in the position that they've drafted at literally every single opportunity they've had when they're high up in the lottery. But I really do think at the end of the day, I just... As much as I want to think the Sacramento Kings are going to do the sensible thing and go with Keegan Murray, I think they're going with Jaden Ivey at four, and I think Keegan Murray's a Detroit Piston at five. I you got to prepare. You, you got to prepare for the worst, Sean. You got to. And wow. listen, man, it's not I'm even the only a worst. One that's going to be it's, right about this. Listen, <laughs> listen, man. Here, here's what it comes down to, because at a certain point, you come down with you come up with the scenarios, and we all have our own philosophies and our own different thoughts of this draft. But at the end of the day, we all know who's the one pulling the trigger. It's Troy Weaver. And who's the Troy Weaver guy of all of these players? As much as I want to believe it's Jay Nivey, Keegan Murray is literally, if you were to, if you were to in a lab make a Troy Weaver guy, it's Keegan Murray. It just is. So I think that's going to be the thing. So, but with that, we're going to quick do an ad. We're going to be quick doing an ad read. We'll be right back with some more NBA draft coverage. This episode of the From Half Court Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. There is no better player in the paint below the waist than Manscaped. When we talk about great post players on this channel, Manscaped is one of the best up-and-coming post players, talking about great cutting-edge technology with products such as the Lawnmower 4.0 and also the Weed Whacker for ear trimming as well. They have cutting-edge technology that, per- that prevents nicks and knacks and cuts and is great 
overall products. They were able to send us a lot of great products as well, including the lawnmower 4.0, all sorts of lotion, shampoo, conditioners. I'm talking about men hygiene and also below the waist grooming. Manscaped is really the best in the business. I'm really grateful to work with such a great company that is all about men's health and men's grooming, and men's safety. And so when looking at the best products you can get, there's really nobody other than Manscaped. Best of all, if you use code HALFCOURT at checkout, you can get 20% off plus free shipping with code HALFCOURT at checkout. Again, with the fourth generation of trimmer features, a cutting-edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents, thanks to their advanced skin-safe technology and the lawnmower 4.0 is waterproof and also has 400k led spotlight when you need a more precise shave again be sure to use code man be sure to use code half court at checkout and you can even get the men the manscape pack that comes with boxers two free gifts in their performance package 4.0 don't wait you can order at manscape.com use code half court at checkout thank you again manscape for sponsoring this podcast and for serving over eight million balls worldwide. All right, and we're back. Thank you so much again to the people at Manscaped for sponsoring the episode. Guys, let's talk a little bit more about the NBA draft, specifically Bryce. I did want to get a little bit to the top of the board because I would be remiss to not talk about these top three prospects, man. We did so much digging and analysis and, and like right before the lottery like i listen man i think we all set ourselves up for failure we got our hopes up we way did. too much and we really were believing we were getting one of these three guys but bryce if you could have had any of those three players who are you taking and why was it going to be jabari smith jr because i know you got to be a jabari guy why do you say i'm a jabari guy i just feel like you brought up the defensive intensity earlier you're praising him on that. I know you're trying. I remember you. You had me pretty sold on Paulo at one point too. We we've we've had some talks about prospects. I remember talking with Paulo, and I was like, "Oh man, I kind of would like Paulo and Cade. That would Dude, be Bry pretty tantalizing." Bryce could sell you a penny, man. I Dude, mean, this guy, he's ridiculous. This man could resell me on the Pistons draft in Darko. I, I could find a way. <laughs> I, I wish I could sell my students on learning anything in class. Like you got, I get people to believe in this stuff. I can't get my students to remember anything I teach them. So, um, well, I mean, you're there. That's chalked when they walk in the door. That's, <laughs> that's true. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. All right. I got Paolo at 1A, uh, Jabari Smith Jr. 1B, and then Chet Holmgren. I'm not super high on Chet. I, I do think – I understand people who are bought into Chet. I get it. I understand it. Just not me. I love Paolo's upside offensively. I just think he can do so many things. I actually thought he was a really good fit for Detroit because he was that secondary creator with Cade Cunningham just from a different position. Like he's a four, maybe a small ball five. Yes, the shooting has to come around a little bit. The defense is probably going to be neutral, but the dude is a bucket. Jabari Smith Jr., the defensive intensity, I talked about it. And then the shooting, the shooting is insane. Yeah. Like, I, I went and watched every single shot attempt from his last season. It's not like he's just catching and shooting. It's on the move. It's off the dribble. He has every mid-post shot that, that there is in the books. Like, it's impressive. I realize he doesn't get to the rim, but the shooting is is so many moments I was like, oh my gosh, like what, like who can I text about what Jabari Smith Jr. just did? Yeah. Um, and so those are my one, a one B I'd be happy with either one of those guys at number one. Yeah, absolutely, man. It, it was to the point where we had to talk down Kool-Aid. We almost had to get a therapist on speed dial. Like, cause this guy was talking about trading up to try and get Jabari Smith oh. Jr. <laughs> in the top of the draft order. And it's like, buddy, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. As great as he is, it's not going to happen, man. I, so Bryce, I'll just come right out and say it. Those uh those Chet Holmgren guys you're talking about, I'm one of them. And you are. I've, okay. I am. I've been I've been watching clips on this guy since his sophomore year of high school. So I I've I've had to mentally uh, uh tug of war with with his physique and and all of those things that that people bring up for a while. And to me, I think I just see so many guys that have come into the league where that hasn't mattered where I'm just way more willing to give that kind of guy a chance. I understand that, you know, he's been so great defensively and he might face more challenges in the league because of that physicality. But 
we've seen guys at least be able to bulk up more in the league. And in addition, as long as positionally he can be stout defensively and as long as instinctively he can stay out of foul trouble, I think he can still be a really good rim protector. Yeah, I I like Chet. I see it. I understand it. I've had people, I think the biggest selling point, which I I think the defense is going to be there, like all the stuff you're talking about. My question is offensively. And I think the biggest selling point people have given to me is he had more in his offensive game than what they allowed him to show at Gonzaga. Gonzaga, you know, and that's what's crazy about college, right? You're like, what are you talking about? Well, Drew Timmy is a bucket in college. <laughs> Maybe not a great NBA guy, but he's a bucket in college. And Mark Few's job is to win national championships. He hasn't yep. done it, but that is his job. It's not necessarily to get Chet Holmgren to the NBA. Well, so let's call, it, let's call it how it is too, Bryce. A lot of these coaches in college are great basketball minds or like a, like are great recruiters, but like schematically it might not always be the most offensive firepower. I mean, there's a reason why we see in college it's 60, 70 point games as opposed to in the pros being, you know, like a hundred plus. Right. I mean, it's just a, I think the other thing, it's just the a pace, different the game pace too, a different pace. Yeah. Different yeah. Game. Well, uh, everything. As a coach myself at a obviously much a different level, but like, you have much a, higher level, much lower. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> like, not only is it high school, it's like 200 kids in the whole school high school. So we're not even talking about like a big <laughs> high school, but you, your seniors, you have a certain connection with. And so even if this freshman comes in, that's a bucket, like you still feel a little bit of loyalty to this senior. Like you want to send like, so I wonder if there's a little bit that of that with Timmy and Chet, like, Timmy's been here. He's been here for three years. And like, there's a connection here and you don't purposely keep Chet down, but there's a little bit of that give and take with those. And so there was more to Chet's all around offensive game, then definitely I'm buying more of that stock. Right. Do you think maybe it comes, if it comes down to fit and if we're just talking about where these guys go in the top three, maybe I think that number two spot for Chet is just so perfect because you do have two primary ball handlers and playmakers in Josh Giddy and Shea Gilgis Alexander, where not a lot of that pressure is on Chet to create the offense itself. But in addition, he's in a system with two other playmakers where he's an underrated playmaker himself. So he could also create some stuff and make things pretty interesting there for them too. Yeah, I, think I like it, it. Yeah. So I think with that fit with those three, and then in addition, the other first round picks they have coming up, which let's be honest, they're not going to be using all of those. They're going to be trading a lot of them. So they, they could, they could very seriously, if that core works out, cash in and become very good, very quickly. So I think that could be a perfect situation for chat. Yeah. I think that's just not, that's a nice spot for him. Orlando's a little bit weird. Like who's the playmaker in Orlando where maybe, but maybe if that's his game, maybe that's better. Maybe he goes there and they allow him to do that a little bit more. So um, I I think him and Jabari, I actually think him and Jabari end up one and two. I think Paolo ends up in Houston. And and again, I actually like Paolo Bencaro in Houston. Mm -hmm. Houston Rockets fans don't seem to because they are in love with uh, Shingun. And I'm like, Paolo is Shingun on. on like on like uh steroids I, or listen, whatever. Can like, I can I just say about Shingun? I feel like there's certain players that's the hip player to like. And I feel like Shingun is the basketball hipster's favorite guy. Like, like, like we heard one guy say this guy could be pretty good during summer league. And now all of a sudden, all of a sudden people are treating him like he's the next coming of Pau Gasol. Like, how did we get here? It's like I was listening like, to a podcast the other day, and I don't remember who they took in their draft, but they're like, oh, yeah, you have a really nice core three players between um, Green, whoever they drafted, and Shingun. I'm like, since when did Shingun become this projected <laughs> big three type player? Like, maybe, listen. I don't get a chance to watch a lot of games outside of the Pistons. Maybe I'm way off base here. It's very possible I am. But this was kind of crazy to me that he was. He averaged 9.6 and five and a half. So I'm not seeing this second coming of freaking Mark and Pau Gasol that all these other people are seeing, man. I mean, I think he could be good. Don't get me wrong. I just think I just think there's just I just think we got to pump the brakes a little bit. That's all I'm saying. Now. What I will say, I, I I am curious because when we're talking about Orlando, you bring up how they don't really have playmakers. I do kind of want to go off the path for just a second. I want to ask about a prospect from last year, Jalen Suggs, the guy that was drafted at the number five overall pick last year for Orlando. This was a guy 
coming into the draft last year before the lottery, I was really high on. I I, I actually liked Jalen Suggs as a player. Maybe maybe I saw his production in college and assumed that would just transfer to the pros. But now he didn't have a great start to his rookie year. Obviously, things got a little better towards the end of the season, but I mean, it can't get worse than how he started. Do you think Jalen Suggs is still a guy that can be a good NBA player? Do you think that pick might have just been a miss? Do you think that do you think our evaluation on him was maybe a little too high at the time? What what do you think of a guy like Jalen Suggs? I, I like Jalen Suggs. I thought he was like, you know, the all the the coach speak. He's a winner. You know, how many times did people talk about him being a quarterback in high school? I remember that was a running joke. Like, did you know Jalen Suggs was a quarterback in high school? You know, and and all of that stuff. I think he'll Dude, be. A good I, I heard this crazy thing on the radio the other day, bro. Did you know Matt Stafford and Clayton Kershaw played baseball together growing up? Oh, he doesn't get the joke. So the joke, okay. So the joke, is, okay. I'm, I'm, okay, Bryce. So the joke is, and if you've lived in the city of Sean, I'm in, old and not from Detroit, so I missed something there. No, you're totally okay. <laughs> I will give you. All right, all right. Really, really, really off the rails. I'm a Packers fan. So I missed that one too. Go ahead. All right, Sean. this one hit only for people in Michigan who watch Lions football. Because literally, we had to hear every Sunday for ten years how oh. Matt Stafford and Clayton Kershaw played baseball together as kids and how they were childhood friends. It was a joke that Jeff thought was kind of funny, and I thought was funny. But anyway, it was for someone out there. If it was for you, let us know, let us know in the comments <laughs> below. But anyway, if you laughed like uh, the mother. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm about to lose a bunch of the only Lions football game I've ever watched is on Thanksgiving. Hey. Outside of that, like. Good for you. Hey, Honestly, you're not faulted for that. You're not no, faulted for if that. Anything, if anything, you're saving yourself from, hey. I mean, you chose to be a, I mean, if, if you're new to being a Pistons fan, you don't want to sign up to be a Lions fan. Believe me. That, if you can choose to stay away from that one, trust me, do it. But <laughs> I, I try to keep up with it a little bit because it floods my timeline. And then people are talking about, I know we're way off the rails. I'm so sorry. Hey, no, but I love this. This is people great. People start talking about the Tigers on my timeline. I have no idea who they're talking about. <laughs> like they're throwing yeah. out names and I'm like, uh, and if it overlaps with a Pistons player, then I get real confused. Like, why is the Pistons player hitting a double? Like, I don't get it. <laughs> and so it's like, what is, and, and then hockey with all due respect to Darren McCart, DMAC is the most famous person I probably ever spoke to. So oh, with I love all due DMAC. respect to DMAC, I have no idea what's going on with the yeah. hockey team, with the Red Wings, or how that game is played, officiated, or anything else. <laughs> hey, that's totally okay. We're, 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 we, we primarily like to stick to basketball over here ourselves anyway, so that's totally fine. But let's talk about, Bryce, what are some prospects that maybe we're overlooking? Because... I think we've, we've for the most part, I think some fans at the beginning got really hyped on Shaden Sharp and for a bit were convinced that was the guy. I think, I think, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm not to call anybody out, but anyway, uh, but I know there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of people like myself that really like Jaden Ivey. There's a lot of people that really like Benedict Matherin. I know there's a lot of guys in this draft. I mean, Troy Weaver said himself, there's eight or nine guys in this draft that he likes. What are some guys that we're not talking about? Because I know there's players like Johnny Davis, who's a really solid guard who can defend really stoutly, perhaps be a mid-range assassin. There, there's, there's some players, Jalen Duran, who's another guy that a lot of people talk about and like. Hey, Jaden, Jaden Hardy. I yeah. like, like Jaden Hardy. Yeah. yeah. What? Yeah. What about? Yeah. What about you, Bryce? What are some? What are some names that you think people are sleeping on a little bit? That that's interesting, Jeff. Like, obviously not at five, but Jaden Hardy. Yeah. If the Pistons got a mid-round first pick into the lo- very end of the lottery, that might be a little high. But Jaden Hardy is a bucket. I think Jaden Hardy is an absolute bucket. He he had a really slow start to his G League Ignite season. It got better. The efficiency numbers weren't great, but you watch the film and those games are played. Obviously, they look like an NBA game, especially compared to college. He's getting quote unquote NBA buckets. He plays with pace. The defense is horrendous. Like it's not very good. <laughs> yeah. But but. I do think he's a good player. And his teammate, Dyson Daniels, is a name that's become very popular. Yes. And yeah. I feel like Pistons fans are really jumping on board with that, which I find interesting considering the similarities to Killian Hayes. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, I mean, listen, Brian, and, and, and this is, in my opinion, it's interesting you bring up Killian. Let's let's maybe talk some 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 of these young Pistons players for a minute and maybe where they can go. And maybe, maybe let's talk about how maybe the draft – impacts that a little bit too because you bring up 
know, if you bring in a guy like Jay Nivey, that affects Killian Hayes significantly. I've always thought the Pistons fan base as a whole, and I know, I know you said you're a little bit newer to the fan base, Bryce, but I think we as a we as a fan base are really selective in who we like and who we're really critical of. For example, if Killian Hayes gets a three, I've never seen a fan base get closer to thinking that a guy is James Harden in my entire life. But if but if Jeremy Grant makes as much as a turnover, is getting shipped out of town to the sh- to the freaking Shanghai Sharks faster than you can say who says no. You know what I mean? Like it's 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 really like again like that's a whole other. It it, it really happened. It was bad with the Luke Kennard days. You couldn't say anything say bad about you couldn't say, say anything coo. bad about Luke Kennard. Say coo. Yeah, yeah, Seku. You couldn't say anything bad about Seku. Exact same thing. We do it with everybody, right? But this is going to be a big put up for, or shut up year for Killian Hayes, and and we've we've talked about it in other platforms and other places. But I mean, obviously, we got to see more from from him in a scoring standpoint. That's not a secret. But as a whole, what do you want to see from Killian Hayes, and what do you want to see from some of our young guys going into next season? Because They've shown a lot of promise, but it's really a matter of just putting it together on a consistent basis, right? Yeah, so Killian, I think you're right. It's it's going to be interesting because we can't use the games played excuse very much longer, right? Like he's about to eclipse 100 games yep. in his career. He's had two off seasons. Hopefully he's been completely healthy this off season. There hasn't been the crazy COVID stuff like God bless us all. Hopefully that stuff is behind us at least to some extent. We can, you know, so like – He's had a normal offseason. He's played 92, I believe, NBA games. Like, we should see some progress this season, hopefully, in his shots. Isaiah Stewart, same thing. Something's got to come offensively. I love Beef Stew. I love, I think he's very valuable come mm-hmm. playoff. You guys talk about playoffs. Him being able to switch the way he can is going to be huge in a playoff series if he can score on the other end. And yeah. then Sadiq Bay, what I want to see there is. I've said I think he's a number three, number four option on like a title contender. I hope he proves me wrong. I hope I I hope that's the worst take I ever have as a Pistons fan, and mm-hmm. that he continues to show progression, and that he could be Cade's wingman on a title contender in four, five, six years. It's not what I see, but I would love to continue to see progression from him. Without a doubt, I hope he does prove us wrong. But in, in all honesty. That's why I want a guy like Jaden Ivey at five because that's where I see Sadiq as well. If we're going to have this team be a winning for, winning formula, I think you're going to need another bucket getter in a second option above Sadiq because I just think with Sadiq scoring, I think we've just seen so far in his career at least, he's not consistent enough to be a reliable number two guy on a winning team. I mean, there's nights where Sadiq can go out and put up 50 points and where literally at halftime he could have 30 and his three's not missing and he – and then there's nights where he's one of 13 from beyond the arc, and it looks like he's literally not even on the court. You even wonder how he put up 13 shots in general. I mean, he's a young guy. He's so phenomenal, and it sounds like I'm nitpicking, but you know what? The reason why I'm nitpicking is because when you're getting to this level and when you want, and especially when you want to see Sadiq be at that level and be a number two guy, that's where you have to nitpick. That's the level of nitpicking that comes with being one of those top guys in your team. In my opinion, it comes with that level of accountability and it has to come with some extra conversation of this is where he's got to be better. Um, Troy, what do you think about, about specifically, you know, like, is there any other young guys in this team? Are there other specific players that you're watching for next season? What you want to see out of them? Because I mean, I know, There's more than guy. There's more than Killian. There's more than you know. There's other guys in this team too, right? Mm -hmm, Absolutely, and um, I think obviously Isaiah Stewart, offensive game developing more too. And uh, you know, we've said on the podcast, you know, I think his rookie year we kind of got a little too excited, a little too quick. Now he's still a phenomenal player, but I think that he is a phenomenal, probably backup center in the league, especially obviously if we get a guy like Aiton in the offseason. Um, so he definitely some improvements on the offensive end because Beef Stew has all the intangibles to do that. He he ha- he's, he has an NBA body. Mm-hmm. Uh, he plays his heart out on the defensive end. So just getting that shot to fall a little more, uh, maybe even some offensive rebound working on that, I think it would be a great thing for, for Beef Stew. Um, and I guess just because he's young, I have to throw his name out there, but I don't expect 
him to maybe even be on the roster toward the end of the year. That's like a guy like Frank Jackson, uh, just because we saw some some really great highlights of him this past year. Well, with- well I want to throw about how about a name that that maybe is is a little bit more in the long term plans. How about Hamadou Diallo? What right. are we getting out of Hami coming out of this season? I mean, are yeah. we going to get that? Are because it's really the tale of two two Hamis, right? There's there's the Hamadou Diallo we got at the beginning of the season who. Uh, was probably more focused on his offensive game, kind of looked dejected, was struggling to get time on the court. And then there's the Hamadou Diallo who led the freaking NBA in steals for for the month of December and was was on a was on a tear on the offensive end and the defensive end. Obviously, some of that was with the COVID games and things like that. But I'm interested to see on where he takes his game next season because I think he's a guy that he can have. I think when you're talking about like like Jay Ivey saying like if he wants to fit next to Cade, he can fit next to Cade. I think I think Hamadou Diallo is one of those guys. If he wants to have a role in this team long term, he can absolutely have a role in this team long term. It's just is he going to be that committed guy that we saw at parts last season? Right. What do you guys think about that? Yeah. No, I think uh, Hami was a guy that we saw flashes of of really high potential. And uh, I, I think he's such an athletic guy, too, um, who just – he can jump out of the gym, man. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I feel like any team can use that. So he's a guy that I would love to to keep around, but I guess it depends on, um, you know, what we're getting consistently out of him. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think every player on this team is starting – the leash is getting tighter. No matter if it's Hamid yeah, Diallo, it's Killian term. Hayes. Like, like you're taking the next step. You can't put up buckets or, or at least get all these attempts on a team that wins 20 games. Like once the Pistons start progressing and you draft a Jay Nivey, the room, there, there's only a little bit of room left for air, like for these guys. So for me, I, I, I mean, for Killian Hayes, I'm excited. I think no doubt the versatility you're getting with Killian, with Isaiah Stewart, with Hamadou Diallo, like that, they can be great role players. Like I, yep. I, I'm not expecting, I've accepted and moved on from where we've taken Killian. It's crazy to think about that Sadiq out of all these guys were taken last between Isaiah Stewart and Killian Hayes, but it is, it is what it is. They worked yep. out and I'm excited to see him progress. I think at the very least you have Killian off the bench, six, five playmaker who, if he can shoot, defensively my god i mean you're in your second year to have a guy like killian hayes it's going to be beneficial for the pistons as well as isaiah stewart moving forward i mean these guys on the perimeter especially you mentioned it bryce with isaiah stewart like what he was able to do towards the end of last year on the perimeter defensively i'm like this guy there's he's always going to be able to play minutes like there's no doubt i mean offensively you want more but still defensively man in the playoffs he'll he'll be valuable yeah there's value there and again he's so young i mean we saw lonzo ball you know, very similar type of player, very similar struggles shooting the ball. Now be a guy who's almost a three point specialist on the offensive end. And then in addition with his playmaking and defensively, we saw what he could do in Chicago before he had that knee injury. We saw the value that he had for them. So I, I still think, I still think Killian could be a really good player in this league. Again, it's never been that he needs to be the superstar on the offensive end. Just be serviceable. Just be NBA level. Yeah. Just be crazy that we're already talking event. about year three, though, with Killian and uh, yep. Sadiq and Isaiah. Mm-hmm. Like, gonna, time, time really flies, guys. We're going to yeah. be talking extensions with those guys soon. Mm-hmm. Yep. What's crazy is like, okay, how much is Sadiq going to get? How much is Isaiah? Are you going to bring Killian? Like all that stuff. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden cap space is going to start getting tied up a little bit in these yep. guys, hopefully because they're performing at a high level. Exactly. Absolutely. And then, and then by the time we're done and wrapped up talking about these guys' extensions, we're going to have Cades right around the corner. So yes. yeah. that's the crazy thing, man. This goes quickly. This goes quickly. So, uh, it's one of those things where, you know, you really want to make sure you're bringing in the right young guys and let's be truthful. Let's just be honest about it. All these young pieces we have on this team right now. When we're seeing the Pistons in contention, not all of them are going to be on this roster. Let's just be real about it. One of these guys is going to be moved at some point. There's a real chance that maybe the number two option comes via a situation you're talking about, Sean, where you have to consolidate these two or three nice young pieces and a draft yep. pick or something. Once that one finally conveys to Oklahoma city and we can trade, but you consolidate those for, you know, the guy on the market and that becomes your number two option. If you don't draft them, if you, you know, free agency, obviously, but I, I agree with you, Sean, I, it, it's, you hate to think about it that yeah. cause you, you like all of these guys, you enjoy yep. watching them play. You're excited about them, 
but I think we all have the same goal as Troy Weaver and everybody else that we want to win. And sometimes you got to make some tough decisions to do that. Yep, exactly. And, and, and at a certain point, there's going to have to be a trade. There's going to have to be a transaction. There's going to be, there's going to have to be something that Troy Weaver is going to have to do that is going to have to upset some fans and it could be a fan favorite. So, um, you know, I'm not saying that's happening anytime soon. I'm just saying that as we're keep going along this process, that's a conversation that something we need to have in the back of our heads. Now, real, qu real quickly, just a note. Did you see the the Sacramento Kings fans jersey swapping Sadiq Bay? Like they're actually going to acquire him to be a trade. And that's I, what I love. I love those. I love fans, man. I, I loved that alone the other day. I wanted to get into it so bad, and I was like, <laughs> not nah, nah, I'm out. <laughs> Bruh, it was wor the worst part. It was King's Muse. It was the King's yes, Stat Muse page. Yes, yeah. yes. And dude, yeah. they got freaking laughed out of the gym by everybody oh. on Twitter. Like even like Pistons Muse responded with like LMAO. <laughs> like literally, they're getting clowned by Pistons fans in their entire comment section. It's kind of it's kind of sad. It's one of those things where you know they tried, they really did, but it's not happening. Sacramento, you can you can try, you can wish all you want. We don't care that much about the fourth pick. I, I, I think Sadiq Bay, while maybe is a little overvalued by us as Pistons fans, the more I see, I think he's undervalued by fans around the league, though. Like I saw a episode, something, there was a video going around Twitter the other day um, where someone was just crushing him, like that he wasn't very good and this and that and the other. And I, I almost retweeted it just so Pistons fans would jump on and, and, and get after it. But there was already like 10 comments about it. So it is kind of interesting, those dynamics of how other people view Pistons players, how we view other pe teams players. Yeah. It, it, it's an interesting dynamic. Listen, man, all I can say, you can tell who has league pass and who doesn't. That's all I'm going to say. You can tell who's actually tuning into the games and who's actually watching these guys play because that's where you get the information on these guys. There's, you know, I, I really firmly believe in a lot of sports, it's really true that stats don't tell the entire story. Absolutely. But with the game of basketball, how nuanced of a game it is, in my opinion, stats merely tell a fraction of the story. So that's why it's so important to have these conversations. And again, Bryce, it's why we love your insight because it's so footage based and so and so eyeball based and so focused on on the fundamentals and what you see in, in your experience of the game. Now, as we're getting to wrapping up the show, we always end with a segment called From Mount Rushmore. And the way this works is my guy Troy takes us on a trip and we normally answer like a Mount Rushmore of like our favorite, like sometimes it'll be our favorite shooters of all time. Sometimes it'll be like things or sometimes we'll even just look back on great players and great teams and great runs. Troy, what do you have in mind for us today? Yeah, today's going to be kind of an easy one, uh, in my opinion, easy, because I feel like there's only four options here. Uh, but hopefully we can have most of the discussion be honorable mention. Uh, and that is going to be the Mount Rushmore of draft steals, NBA draft steals of the past or of the previous decades so 2010 to 2019. So players who were drafted maybe in the later first round um, or maybe even second round who who became all stars and can't miss stars. And uh, players that obviously teams passed on in the, the lottery or later in the lottery and um, and who are now stars. So I'll begin um, again. I think this, this list really only goes four deep, but it has quite a few honorable mentions. And that'll be Clay Thompson drafted 11 overall by Golden State in 2011. Uh, obviously, no one of the best shooters of all time, just very much impacted even. 11 years later here in 2022, uh, an NBA mm -hmm. championship. Uh, but to get that guy at 11, he's a hall of famer. Uh, you could, you could make the argument that he got snubbed for the 75th uh, best players this past year. So to me, Clay Thompson has to be on that list to go yeah. 11 and to have that much of an impact on the game. Um, I think that is a remarkable steal without a doubt. I'll go next. Cause this one, I feel pretty comfortable on this one. Yeah. Uh, Nikola Jokic was drafted during a Taco Bell commercial. This man, yeah. they were talking about a Chalupa Supreme. Hey, this man was getting drafted. Taco, Taco Bell stuff, though, Sean. Like, uh, so. <laughs> hey, hey, I love Taco Bell. You know what I mean? Go to, go there, get yourself a quesarito, a Baja Blast. 
you know, I haven't I eaten or drank anything that you've mentioned so far. I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> but Joker, you might, has you might to be, be a little bit more of a healthier guy than me, Bryce. That's okay. But I mean, listen, man, Nikola Jokic, this guy, you know, two time back to back MVP, uh, one of the best big men in the history of the league. What the things this guy can do on the offensive end. This guy's a wizard. He's an anomaly of a player as far as everything he can do on a basketball court. Nikola Jokic is unreal. So he's got to be on that list. Does Draymond count? I know you gave the years. Is Draymond too late? Draymond counts if you want to have him, yeah. Yeah, he's 2012, okay. 35th pick in the 2012 draft. Yeah. I mean, I know Draymond doesn't have a lot of fans, and, and people get frustrated with him, and he whines a lot and all that stuff. He has here, man. He has fans I, here. I, I love I, Draymond Green. I'm a fan in terms of I respect the value he brings to that Warriors team and how much he has contributed to the winning of that team. Now, he's in a really good role, right? Like, because you have a Steph Curry who you have to double, and then it really amplifies what Draymond does well. But I think Draymond Green um, can be underappreciated at times, so uh, he definitely makes the list for me. I fully yeah. agree, Bryce. Um, he yeah. would have been probably an honorable mention for me because I think there's two – there's two we're big time missing here. But, Jeff, can you name one of the two? Uh, I'm going Siakam. That's who mine is. 27th overall. For a okay, guy. Troy, I know who Who's you're your thinking two? here. I know one person that's on your list that you're thinking. It's Kawhi Giannis Leonard, and Kawhi. isn't it? Giannis and Kawhi Dude, both 15. First of all, he went 27. Kawhi went 15. Hold on. First 15's of all, not on. 10. Shh, hold on. First of all, Troy, you said last decade. Kawhi was drafted 2011, uh, 11 yeah. years ago, buddy. No, 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 no. I said last decade as in 2010 to 2019. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, the decade of the teens, yeah, yeah. All right, so yeah, of course Kawhi Leonard's going to be on that list. Of course yeah, Giannis fuck, is going to be on that yeah. list. Of it's course Donovan yeah. Mitchell is going to be on that list. Like, of course those guys are going to be there. Right. But I only didn't pick Kawhi because you made the parameters of the last decade, and I thought the last 10 years, Troy. Sorry. Uh, but, but Siakam's a good pick, Jeff. And, and I think that's yeah. where I kind of wanted to go most with this is is just the next maybe three or four minutes, just all of us shouting out names and why. So what why Siakam, Jeff? Um <laughs> I don't know. I just got thrown off for a second. But uh Siakam, yeah. So 27th overall. I, you could have went with Giannis, you could have went with Kawhi. Uh, and personally, my favorite player in the NBA is Devin Booker. I think that yeah. was a steal, if I had to say myself, looking back. Donovan Mitchell, another one. But, yeah, Siakam, 27th overall for a guy who obviously has a ring now with Kawhi Leonard. He's the number one option uh, on the Toronto Raptors. And even during a down year, he averaged 21 and 7. So, give me Siakam, man, for where he was drafted. If you did a redraft of that same draft class, he goes number one mm -hmm. overall. So. What about Jimmy? Fred Van Vliet? Fred Van yeah. Vliet wasn't yeah. even drafted yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. 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 How about Jimmy Butler, man? 30th mm -hmm. overall, a guy that okay. when he came into the league, people didn't really think he was going to have much of a future or really what he was going to be at all. And now he's a guy that literally carried a team to the Eastern Conference Finals and was a three-point shot away from bringing that team to the finals. So, again, by the way, after he did it in the bubble, I mean, talk about an all-star caliber player right there. I mean, Rudy Gobert, he was a, another – low draft pick player. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't love him as an offensive player and he's probably the most hated player in the league. So we don't really like to give this guy much props, but as a defensive player, he's a freaking freak of nature. How about Chris Middleton? Yeah, absolutely. That's the thing, man. If you draft well, there's a litany of steals years from now. Sadiq Bay is going to be on this Mount Rushmore. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Paul, he's going to be on George, this Mount Rushmore. 2010. Absolutely. Hey, Jordan, Poole. Jordan Poole's another one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember when a couple years ago people called Jordan Poole the worst pick of the first round? Look how that takes look how that takes right. aging. That's that's yeah. really the 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 ultimate truth of it all, guys, is that if you draft well, if you draft right, it can really do dividends and you can really find value no matter where it is in the first round. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can, can I add to that real quick though, Sean? Absolutely. Yeah. When you have a superstar in place, it, exactly. I think is a huge caveat because then that allows other people to be in the role that they need to be in. And with all due respect to what Jordan Poole did this year, because his journey in the NBA has been incredible, his he's in a really nice role there with right. the Golden State Warriors because of all the other pieces. Andrew Wiggins is the same thing. Yeah, Andrew, you like 
everybody's like, oh, can Andrew Wiggins go be a number one on another team? No. Like he, you said, he, it's about the system. It's about yeah. where they fit. Those guys he, were able to come in and do what they got to do yes. because their role, they, they were specialties. They were because specialty Steph players. Curry's there and Clay's there and Draymond does his role and all these things. Like, I just think those are important pieces to, yep. to take note of as well, that you have to be in the right role to reach the success for those type of players. Not every player, but mm-hmm. Cade can go anywhere in the country and be successful. Exactly. That's not true for every single player. Yeah. Exactly. And that's why, you know, you talk about with guys like Jay Nivey. That's why I talk about his defensive fit with Detroit. That's why I'm less worried in Detroit because there's a culture there. There's yes. a standard there. Whereas Sacramento, objectively, there's not. That's not even being funny. There just isn't even a culture there. Let's mm-hmm. just be real about it. So, And one last thing, Sean, I wanted to close with little game. I, we, we, I asked uh, Bryce this question when we had our little uh, commercial break, and that is going to be, We've all followed basketball for, for years now. I want us to give us two players, okay, all four of us. One player is going to be someone that we thought was going to be great, personally, that we thought was going to be great, but ended up being kind of a bust. And another player who we thought was going to be uh, great, but no one around us thought anyone, it was going to be great. But we ended up being right uh, and everyone else being wrong. So, um, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. yeah. Go uh, so I'll go first. So – a player that I wanna I wanna take claim on that I've been right about for years. I really liked Spencer Dinwiddie even when we drafted him in the second round. I would watch a lot of Pistons content and every video that they would have of bringing in draft prospects, even following years. Like you would always just see whatever footage the Pistons would post. It just had Spencer Ben Dinwiddie always in a gym. And that was the thing that I loved about him was that this guy was just always working. He was always, you know, always plugging away at his craft. So I just thought he was going to work out. And, you know, I, when he, when he ultimately got traded away, I thought it was a mistake. And lo and behold, that turned out to be kind of right. Now, a guy that I was dead, dead out wrong about, I thought Stanley Johnson was our best draft pick in a long time. I thought, I thought his defensive intensity that he brought year one, I thought he was going to get better offensively. I thought he was going to be a stud. God, was I wrong on that. Yeah. So you had two Pistons picks. Um, I'm just going to go just NBA broad here. And a uh, pick that I thought was going to be great but did not was number two overall by uh, Philly back in 2013 with Nurens Noel. I thought he was going to be the next big man. I really did. Uh, but no, not not at all. <laughs> Noel. Um, yeah. No, no, yeah. No, no, Noel. But then <laughs> – even though I was just a little kid and I only watched a few college games, maybe it was the hype around him. Um, but I, I truly saw something special in Steph Curry as a college guy. I really did. I was only fifth grade, whatever, but I always remembered him a little bit. And I always knew he would, I didn't think th- the stardom that he'd have today, but I always knew he'd impact uh, a team. Another guy I want to make on the list that I was wrong about was Jimmer. I thought Jimmer would be an all-star. Jimmer would be an all-star. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know what's another one I got my hopes up on big time? Brandon Knight. He oh, was yeah. the first Thanks. player I grew Thanks. up watching mixtapes on. And then when the Pistons drafted him, I was so psyched. Yeah, didn't work out too well. How about you yeah. guys, Bryce and Jeff? You go first, yeah. Bryce. Yeah, so I don't think this completely matches up with what you want, but Joel Embiid was a guy I was super hot. Like I I think there were people who questioned yeah. him a little bit coming out of Kansas and Obviously, I'm from Kansas. I grew up a KU fan. Sorry to all the Michigan and Michigan State fans. But hey, if you're I, from I, Kansas, that's the basketball factory, man. You got to root for that. So I, I was pretty high on him. I told you guys during the break, Adam Morrison like was a guy I thought was going to be good in the league. And um, yeah. kind of like the Jimmer for that thing, I was obviously wrong. And then, <laughs> you know, Luka Doncic was a guy, not necessarily coming into the draft, but then even after, like, I was one of those guys like, oh, he's been playing professionally. The ceiling isn't that much more, blah, blah, blah. Like, I was just an idiot. I was stupid. It was wrong. And mm-hmm. so I was kind of wrong on, like, what his ceiling could be right. moving forward. Yeah, I think that guy might have a future in basketball in some form. He, I'm not he's, sure. Uh, he's not bad. Yeah, he might be okay. He He, <laughs> he might have a career in the NBA someday. Uh, Jeff, what about you, man? <laughs> what, I, I, what, what you... I, I wanna I wanna share my my two bad predictions. One of them being Seku, actually, because I watched Seku oh. hit like 25 threes, 
straight. And I saw the measurables. I'm like, okay, this guy has it all. If he could just put it together, you have the French, you have French v. French, you have Killian Hayes. That's why I was so excited after the, they drafted Killian Hayes. I'm like, all right, great. We have a we have a great foundation. You got guys, especially in today's NBA, Sekou, if he could put it together, I would have loved him. But, you know, he just didn't have that motor. He didn't have the dog in him. So that fell apart. But at, at first, I was very excited that he fell to us. And now yeah. it makes sense why he fell to us because it all kind of – he was at first, he was, you know, projected to go top 10. Yeah. And then he's yeah, there he's in the middle of the like team. Nine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and then he's in there in the middle of the team. So I was definitely wrong on that. And another one I was wrong on, which kind of just went out the window completely, was Markel Fultz. Like, I was so – when Philly got Markel, I, I was like, wow. They, they got – a great player. I watched a lot of them at, at Washington and then how coming into Philly forgot how to shoot. And then everything else just kind of panned out the way it panned out. So those are two I was absolutely wrong on. I guess if I had to give one, I was right on. Uh, it's, it's funny because you don't really remember the ones like I'd like a lot of players, but the ones that stick in my head are the ones I'm wrong on. Those, yeah, those yeah. bug me. Those haunt you. Like, I will say, I will yeah. say when I was 10, I was really stout. On the on that on the fact that the Trailblazers should have drafted Kevin Durant instead of Greg Oden, and that was before the draft. Oh, yeah, I yeah, thought yeah, that yeah. I thought that before the draft, and I was ten. So I will, like, I, I I I will say this: I wanted Donovan instead of Luke Kennard. Yeah, I'll put that straight. Right, like that right. was my. I don't want to say I got it right because he that was the clear pick. Right. But if I had to give well, one, I, I wanted Donovan in Detroit. No doubt. Yeah. About it. Oh, you should have. You should have told. Stand <laughs> I mean, that was the. <laughs> freaking right pick that anyway that's gonna do it bryce my guy thank you so much for being here man we we love you dude seriously like you are welcome on anytime we're definitely gonna have to have you on at some point here soon before the season we're, we might have to do a we might have to do a from half court cross pistons pulse podcast at some point that'd be that'd be pretty fun man so no doubt, uh, no doubt. yeah so well uh, where can people find you man at motor city hoops on twitter obviously that's one big place but we're all where all can people find you my guy yeah, so most of the stuff is on Twitter, the YouTube channel, Motor City Hoops, Bryce Simon, you can find it there. And then the Pistons Pulse podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you want some more draft content, I got those video breakdowns on MavsDraft.com. Write some articles for DetroitBadBoys.com. Um, so follow on Twitter, and then I'll let you know about it after that. Guys, I, I had a blast. Thank you so yeah. much. I appreciate it. You guys worked it out time-wise. I don't know how late it is where you guys are at, but I appreciate it. It worked into my schedule. Thank you. And I always enjoy talking Pistons with you guys. Hey, yeah, absolutely, you, man. Much love, man. Yeah, absolutely. Much love, man. You're welcome on any time. You're going to be one of our, at one of our, you know, semi, at, le- at least semi regulars, man. Cause you, you definitely got to, you know, you know, you're a busy man yourself, but we would definitely love to have you anytime. But and, also, and Bryce, real quick, real quick. Yeah. Not that um, th- I'm adding Bryce into my uh, guys that I was high on. All right. Because I love Bryce so much. I wanted Bryce to get him on the morning show as much as I could exactly. with Adam. And, and this guy, he has it, man. Like you're, you're yeah. doing great things and I'm happy for you. Yeah, Thank you absolutely. So much. Hey, and now we have our own place where we can have him on as much yes. as we want and all that stuff. And, 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 and listen, man, he's just one of these guys got to be listening to. And, and, and listen, we just, we just love the game of basketball ball here and this is from half court where we bring in guys like bryce because we just want to talk about the game of basketball man if that's what yeah. you're about if that's what you like be sure to like this video subscribe to the podcast share with your friends and join the conversation in the community because this is a place where we just love the game of basketball even if you're not a pistons fan we talk about the entire league here but also be sure to be following my guy troy at troy sergey 44 be sure to be following my guy jeff at jeff i Frady. myself at Sean Half Court right down here. But also be sure to click join down below, become a member from Half Court. Be sure to go at, to Manscaped, use code Half Court, get that figured out downstairs. But anyway, guys, that is going to do it. I want to thank y'all so much for tuning in. And we will catch you next time from Half Court. Be sure to subscribe.